This is probably the single messiest tool in my shop. And I'm gonna do something about that today. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. You've seen me use my Evolution 15 inch cold saw in a previous video, and you'd probably see it more if it didn't make such a horrendous mess. It seemed like such a good idea, but the chips, oh, the chips, they go everywhere. I don't usually find any in my hair for obvious reasons, but that's about the only place they don't end up. If you're not familiar with this tool, it's called a cold saw. It has a slow speed carbide blade designed specifically for cutting metal. This one's a 14 inch blade specifically for steel. You just clamp your workpiece in here and cut it off. It's not a wood saw. This is designed for cutting tubing or even metal solids, but in the process, it throws chips everywhere. And unlike a hot saw that's gonna throw sparks or you know grinding debris, this thing throws little chips that just bounce and go everywhere. It does have a tray for catching the chips and you can see that's all it caught when I cut those six inch aluminum rounds a few weeks ago. It does not really work. This thing really needs a better dust collection system and that's what I'd like to do today. There's a little guard here on the back that catches the chips that come off of the back of the blade and prevents those from going all over the shop. And this really does seem like a good location for a vacuum port. I really don't know why they didn't incorporate something like that into the saw initially. Vacuum hose could come in from the side or from the back. You know, most woodworking miter saws have that. I have no idea why they didn't have it here, but we should be able to make one. This part that came on the saw really is the ideal size. It's already optimized for the full movement of the blade. We just need to scan this thing add a vacuum port and 3D printer replacement. If you've ever worked with a visible light or an infrared 3D scanner, then you know that the black surface on this part is really not ideal. The black just sucks up the light and makes it very difficult for the scanner to pick up the details. And that's where scanning sprays come in. This particular brand sprays on, puts a nice matte white coating on, but then later sublimates directly into the air so there's no cleanup required. I've got a couple of versions here. The blue one lasts about four hours and the orange one lasts 12 to 24 hours before it sublimates. I think we'll just use the short one. A four hours should be plenty of working time for this project. And it just sprays on and then as it dries, it turns white. So I'll just get a good coating on all of the surfaces. The stuff is relatively expensive. If it works as well as they say, then it's definitely worth it, but you don't wanna go wasting this stuff. I'll just get a nice even coat on the entire outside of the part and then let it dry. And we should have a nice white matte finish that's easy to scan. I've learned quite a bit from playing with this Einstar scanner since the last time you saw it in a video. And the first thing I learned is you really do need to recalibrate it. It comes with a calibration card. And if you move to a new location, especially under different lighting conditions, you really need to run through the calibration sequence again. This makes a huge difference in the scanner being able to track what you're scanning. The other thing that I learned is when you're scanning small objects, especially if you want to scan the entire outside surface of the object, you really need a turntable and you really need a sea of tracking points, a sea of markers on that turntable so that the scanner has something to track as it goes around the corner to the other side of the object and loses visibility of the previously scanned geometry. The markers on the turntable allow the scanner to retain its tracking as you go around the corner. I'm also putting some markers on the part because I'm not sure exactly what I'm gonna need to align the multiple scans. As far as settings, I've also learned that you really want to use the medium and large object setting with hybrid alignment, even for small objects. And the reason for this is it allows you to get the scanner back further so that the eyes on the opposite ends of the scanner, the two cameras, can actually see into hollows of the object better than they would be able to do if you got really close to the object in the small object scanning mode. So then it's just a matter of rotating the object slowly and scanning all sides of it from this side. I also turn the scanner to the side. Again, it changes the angle of those two cameras and allows it to see into narrow openings it wouldn't have been able to reach otherwise. 
And as long as you keep enough of those markers on the turntable in view, the scanner will keep track of its position and won't lose its place. And once you have uh, enough geometry scanned and all the surfaces are showing green, or at least all the surfaces that you can see from this side are showing green, then it's just a matter of going in, deleting all of the scan data from the actual turntable surface, which we don't want. That's not a part of our object. And this allows us to clean it up and then we'll be left with a mesh or left with a point cloud that just contains the surfaces of the part that were visible when scanning from this side of the object. Get that all cleaned up, generate a point cloud, and this isn't the whole object, it's just the stuff that's visible from the top. Then we can create a new project, set it up with exactly the same settings, then flip the part over and perform the same operation, scanning the part from the other side. Now this is gonna pick up all the geometry that's visible from the other side, and in theory, we should have all of the surfaces. And we'll go back through, remove the turntable, clean up all the data, and then we should have two separate scans that we can then merge together to get the complete object. Aligning the two separate scan projects together is easy. This is a feature that's just built into the Shining 3D software. I'll just select one project and the other, and then make sure that the feature auto align is selected and click apply. And this will just use the geometry of the objects to try to fit them together. I had those extra markers on the object just in case I needed them, but it wasn't necessary. You can see the red data in this bottom viewport came from one scan and the green data came from the other. And it's, you know, on opposite sides of the model because we scanned it from opposite sides. So that's pretty much exactly what we expect. There is still a little bit of garbage here that I didn't get properly cleaned up from the initial scans. I'll delete that and then we'll mesh the model. We've got a bunch of options. I am gonna select a watertight model this time because in theory we do have all of the surfaces of the object. I'm just gonna leave everything here at defaults and click apply and see what happens. This will try to fill the holes left by the markers and the holes left by shadows and little incomplete bits of the scan. And as you can see, it does a pretty decent job. There are some soft corners where we had a little bit of data missing, but honestly, for this kind of object in this kind of scale, under the conditions we had, this looks really good. I will use the optimization features to do a little bit of smoothing, try to find a level for the smoothing that doesn't mush all of the detail, but still leaves pretty presentable surfaces. And then I'll go back through and establish the coordinate system and the origin. You've seen me do this in a previous video by fitting planes. Check out the lathe scanning video if you wanna see the details. And then it's just a matter of saving the scan as an OBJ file, so we have something to import into Fusion 360. To bring the mesh into Fusion 360, I'll just say insert, insert mesh, select from my computer and browse and find the OBJ file that I exported. And that brings in the mesh. Now, technically we could try to work with this in the mesh workspace, but I prefer to use the mesh as a guide to create a solid model of the part. The workflow for this is pretty standard. We just go to mesh, create a mesh section sketch, and then select the object, select a plane, offset it to the height that we want, and it will take a cross-section cut through the mesh and create guidelines in a new sketch that we can use for modeling. Now these lines that it's created are orange, they're not black. These aren't real sketch geometry, they're just guides you can use to create sketch geometry. And I prefer to edit the sketch and just draw this stuff in myself. So I'm just coming in here hitting L for line and actually creating line segments wherever there are flat, straight lines in the guide, and then coming back with the tangent arc command and actually putting arcs between these. Tangent arc command puts the tangent constraint at the beginning of the arc, and then I have to come back and add it to the end so I get smooth surfaces. And then as I get the sketch built out, I'll go back and put in actual dimensions in places where I can measure the object and I know the exact dimensions that I want. And then from there, it's just a matter of extruding to start creating geometry, grabbing another section through the part at another angle, turning that into a sketch, and then turning that into regions that I can extrude. And I'm just slowly 
bringing the part to life from these sections that I'm taking from the mesh. And then once I have the whole part modeled, it's time to go add the new features that I want. To actually create the port, I will need a sketch and I'll construct that on a plane. So I'll select construct plane at angle, select this line and rotate that plane to 45 degrees. I chose 45 degrees just to make this easier to 3D print. Then I'll create a sketch on that plane and create a circle. Now I know how big I want the vacuum port to be to fit the adapter that I have. So I'll set that to 58 millimeters and then I will use the offset tool to create a five millimeter wide wall. So I just have two circles, one on the outside 58 millimeters and one five millimeters inside of that. I'll move that around so that it looks to me like it's in about the right place so that the port will go through the part in a reasonable way. Then select that region, hit E for extrude, switch this to two sides and extrude this out. Now, of course, I don't want that to cut. I want it to join. I'll extrude that in both directions so that I now have a tube that is going through the part. That looks like it's in about the right position. We can always adjust it later if it's not. But that looks okay. Click OK. Select the part of the tube that's going inside. Hit the delete key and now we have a tube coming down to the surface. I'll just select this inside region again, hit E for extrude. We'll leave this in cut mode and just cut through the side of the part. Now there is some extra geometry. I could have cut both directions, but I can just as easily come in here, select some surfaces and hit the delete key and just remove the geometry that I don't need. And now we have a vacuum port going through our dust shield. I would like a little bit of a taper on the end of the vacuum port here, so I'll use the chamfer command with the two distances, bring it in about half a millimeter and back about 10, that'll give me a little bit of taper, and then I will just go around the part and start cleaning this up with fillets. Just hit F for fillet, select edges, put in a radius, and start adding curves to clean this up and make it look nice and remove the stress risers that would be there in the corners otherwise. And because I haven't done it already, I will go up here and select the body and give it a name. And the reason I'm doing this will become apparent in a moment when we go to 3D print this. We'll just call that vacuum port, say file, 3D print, select that body, click OK. And now you can see vacuum port, the name of the body is automatically selected as the file name. Choose an output directory, save it and then we'll bring this up in Bamboo Studio so that we can 3D print it. Now, this has got a lot of weird geometry and doesn't really have many flat sides, but if I stand it on the end of the port, most of the surfaces are gonna grow away from that at a 45 degree angle, which should be a perfectly printable overhang, though there are a few areas that are still gonna need support. So we'll go to the Support tab, Enable Support, set it to Tree Auto, click Slice, and see what it does. And that produced some nice organic tree supports that look like they are supporting all of the positions where we need support. And they also look like they should be pretty reasonable to break away. There's not a lot of contact area. There's just contact in the areas where it needs to be. We don't have big blocks of self-supporting material. So this should be pretty easy to remove once it's printed. I started this print in the high temperature carbon fiber nylon and then thought about it and started another one in PLA because it would be done sooner and I could find out if I needed to stop the nylon one. But of course the PLA one failed so I had to restart it and by the time I did that both of the prints ended up finishing about the same time. Which is fine. I went ahead with the PLA print because I wanted to see if I had some kind of a problem with my PLA bed adhesion. but. Apparently it was a one-off event and it finished just fine. So now I have one in carbon fiber nylon and I have one in PLA that I don't need, but it's kind of pretty. In the time it took us to make the new part, you can see that the scanner spray has completely sublimated off of the original part. There's still a little bit under the marker dots, but once I take those off, it will sublimate too. I have the new part off of the 3D printer here and you can see this thing is just gorgeous. 
This is the Bamboo Lab PA high temperature carbon fiber and the results that I've gotten with this material are just outstanding. It looks good, but the real question is whether it fits. I mean, it better fit. I scanned the part and yep, it fits. It has little tabs on the bottom to locate it and those fit nice and neat into the holes. As long as the screws align, we should be good. And it looks like we're good. I made a 3D printed hose coupler for the vacuum. This is Ninja Tech Cheetah. This is a thermoplastic urethane. And this is the same process I used to make the coupler for the surface grinder. This just goes on with a little hose clamp that is nice and secure. And then the vacuum hose should just snap in. And it does. Looks like the clearance is the same as the original part. Fit looks good. I just need to grab a piece of steel and we need to test this and see if it gets the chips. I have a piece here of two by three inch by one eighth inch wall mild steel tubing. Just clamp this up and take a cut. Now I've got safety glasses and hearing protection because this thing is loud. Get the vacuum going, take a cut and see what happens. Now this isn't a particularly slow carbide saw, it's quite a bit slower than a wood saw, but still pretty fast, which is part of why it makes such a big mess. Now that actually looked pretty decent. I do see a few chips there on the welding table. Let's go ahead and rotate this and try a 45 degree miter cut and see if that behaves any different. Just flip the fence around, clamp it back in. and have another go at it. I'm a little bit concerned that the chips are gonna get caught inside the tube and be flushed out the end where the vacuum will not catch them. And since mitering is one of the major applications for this saw, that will be a pretty big problem. And yeah, you can see there are a lot of chips coming out of the end of that tube. Let's see what we've actually got. Yeah, there's quite a bit here on the table. And yeah, there's a lot of chips in the tube. So keep in mind that that's the stuff that went to the left, the stuff that went to the right, which is the favored direction, probably all ended up on the floor. And yeah, there it is in all its glory. I don't think it's as many chips as I normally find on the floor, but that is still quite a mess. And this is just the beginning. It's quite a bit on the table here that got away and the stuff on the floor went for a radius of about 10 or 15 feet from the saw. This stuff is just insidious. After sweeping the shop floor and dumping out the vacuum, the pile on the left is what I got off the floor and the pile on the right is what came from the vacuum. So I'd say vacuum caught about 60%. I mean, that's something, but I still have to sweep the floor. So I'm really not sure this is worth it. That was a lot of work and I learned a lot about 3D scanning and modeling, but in the end, I really don't think I'm gonna end up using the vacuum port. Catching 60% of the chips doesn't really help me very much if I still need to sweep up the entire shop when I'm done anyway. I'd love to have the saw up on a bench for ease of use, but in my small shop, that just means the chips get broadcast even further. I have a fabrication project coming up and I'll probably go back to using the saw on the floor in a corner where at least the mess is contained. If you do something like this, be aware that hot chips are hot and you should be prepared for that so you don't melt your vacuum or start a fire. A cyclone separator in a metal bucket might be a good idea. Just use your head and proceed at your own risk. If you enjoyed this video or found it useful, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and consider supporting the channel over on Patreon. Patrons can download files for all of my projects, including this one, for what it's worth. Thank you for watching.